Welcome to the first part of Lecture 5. We're going to be discussing the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. The title is Integral or Antiderivative. Is there a difference? The Fundamental Theorem was developed by this gentleman on the left-hand side named Isaac Barrow. Creating the fundamental theorem of calculus is obviously a major achievement, but he also has the claim to fame of being a teacher to Isaac Newton. Now, when I first started studying calculus, I had absolutely no appreciation for the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is because I was focused on being a technician of calculus, not a practitioner. And as you grow as a problem solver, you want to move towards becoming a practitioner yourself because you'll find that that's going to help you on everything that you work on. And what do I mean by the difference between a technician and a practitioner? Well, a technician is someone who just learns the particular rules and manipulations that you have to do and never really thinks about the meaning or why they're doing them, whereas a practitioner focuses more on the meaning and understanding why they're doing it as well as also learning how to be a technician. And you'll find that if you focus on the meaning and understanding, then you're able to do much more sophisticated things than a technician can do, because you'll be able to recognize different opportunities where things that you have applied and you've learned can be applied under a new circumstances. And people who are technicians in a particular area usually are not able to make that leap. So what does this theorem really mean? Well, it, it has two main applications. The first is it shows that the derivative and the integral are inverses, inverse operations of each other. And while that might seem obvious to you because you've been told it and you've seen it and you've been using it for many years, I'll show you in just a second why that might not be such an obvious thing. The second thing is it tells us precisely how we can actually evaluate a definite integral, which is also an incredibly useful rule to know. Now, in the previous lectures, we've been interpreting the derivative as the tangent to a curve or to a function at a particular point, and the integral as a signed area. And if I interpret them in that fashion, there really doesn't seem to be any connection at all between the two. It's not obvious that the tangent should be related to the area, the signed area under a particular curve. Instead, however, let's think as the ancient English natural philosophers were in the 1600s. Think of position as the integral of velocity, and velocity as the derivative of position. And if I think of it in that sense, these two ideas seem much more naturally connected. And you know from your first year mechanics class that this is indeed the one of the most important applications of derivatives and integrals into physics. All right, so let's step on to the proof. Our goal is that we want to relate the integral and the derivative to show that they are inverse operations between one another. And so we're going to begin with the definition of a function that we're going to call big F of t defined via an integral. It's the integral from a to t of f of x dx. And we make the requirement that f of x is both continuous and monotonic on the range from a to b, with t being some number that lies inside that interval of a to b. Then the fundamental theorem of calculus says the derivative of big F of t with respect to t is equal to little f of t. And this is, of course, a rule that all of you know. You can apply it, and you've uh, certainly encountered it many, many times in the manipulations that you've been doing in calculus. So let's see how we prove it. So what we want to do, as we would for anything like this, we have to start with the definition. What is the definition of the derivative of capital F of t with respect to t? Well, it's simply the limit f of t1 minus f of t divided by t1 minus t in the limit as t1 approaches t. All right, so let's now substitute in what f of t is. F of t is defined by the integral, so I have an integral from a to t1, f of x dx, minus an integral from a to t, f of x dx, and now I can combine those two integrals, and by combining those two integrals, I'll get one integral, which is going from t to t1 of f of x dx, and I'm going to assume without a loss of generality that my monotonic function is actually an increasing function. You can do a very similar thing with a decreasing function, it just changes the order of the inequalities. But if I have a monotonic increasing function, then 
what it says is in the interval where t1 is bigger than t, then f of t will be less than or equal to f of x will be less than or equal to f of t1 for all x inside that interval. That's if you like the definition of what a monotonic increasing function is. So given that, we're now going to multiply by t1 minus t, and we're going to recognize that the interval, the integral from t to t1, must lie in between the width t1 minus t multiplied by f of t and t1 minus t multiplied by f of t1. Since the object on the left is the area under a rectangle that has a height of f of t, and the object on the right is the area of a rectangle that has a height of f of t1, and the integral must lie somewhere in between that because f of x is moving from f of t to f of t1. So from that, if we divide both sides now by t1 minus t, what we see is f of t is less than or equal to big F of t1 minus big F of t divided by t1 minus t, and that will be less than or equal to f of t1. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as t1 approaches t. The object in the middle will approach the derivative, and f of t is going to approach f of t1 because the function f is continuous by one of the conditions in our theorem. So that tells us, because the derivative is pinned between two numbers that are approaching the same value, that df big F of t with respect to t must equal f of t. And that's it. That's the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, it can be extended to a general continuous function that is piecewise monotonic by just breaking it up into individual pieces and applying this theorem on each of those pieces. Okay, there's a corollary to this theorem which says if we have a function that satisfies d phi of x dx equals f of x, then phi of t will equal big F of t plus some constant. And that is called the antiderivative of f. Now, the constant is not defined. And you know if you take an integral without any limits, it is defined up to some arbitrary constant that can be added to it. However, it does allow us to now evaluate definite integrals because the integral from a to b would just equal phi of b minus phi of a. And this works because the constant in the antiderivative is now going to cancel. So there are an infinite number of antiderivatives, but I have to use the same antiderivative when I evaluate phi of b as I do for phi of a. And that means that they have the same constant, and so then that constant cancels when I take the difference. And so it'll end up being f of b, big F of b minus big F of a, as determining what that integral is equal to. And so the definite integral has only one value. It's uniquely defined, even though there are an infinite number of antiderivatives due to the constant c. Another important point that we have to make is that if f is continuous, this by no means implies that f is differentiable. The derivative may not exist, as given by the result in figure 81 of the book, which is shown here on the bottom left, or by the classic example of an absolute value, which is given on the right. Let's start with the absolute value. You can see the slope on the left-hand side is minus 1. The slope on the right-hand side is plus 1. And at the point x equals 0, the slope is not defined, because the limit as I approach from negative x will give me minus 1. The limit as I approach from positive x will give me plus 1, and I don't know which one to pick. Similarly, if you look at the book, and the book's example might be a little bit confusing, but what it's doing is it's drawing a curve that is a set of circles whose radius is becoming half as big as I move to the left. And you can see that if I evaluate the derivative at a point close to the top of the circle, not exactly at the halfway point of the circle, it'll go to that line on the upper part, and if I evaluate it on the corresponding negative part, it'll go to a line on the lower part, and as that radius gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the function gets closer and closer to a constant, and the function is completely continuous, but that derivative will be any value between an angle of plus phi and an angle of minus phi, and it keeps changing as I move closer and closer. It changes more and more rapidly, and it has absolutely no 
definition for precisely what the derivative is at that endpoint at zero. Similar to absolute value, there are many different values and the derivative simply cannot be defined. So it's important to remember that if a function is continuous, that does not imply that it's differentiable. But the converse, however, is true. If the function is differentiable, then it must be continuous. Otherwise, I would not be able to define the derivative. So anytime you have a differentiable function, you can automatically conclude that it is continuous.